like to talk about the, the book that we have, we've been working on, the book with uh, uh, Professor Carl Ernst, who is here. And also, we, you know, many of our colleagues, students, Brian is here, Zoo is here, and Yasmin and others. And the book, the, for many of us who are not familiar with it, we are just arguing that Omar Ibn Said, uh, a West African Muslim scholar who was enslaved in North Carolina for over half a century, left behind a small body of Arabic writings that became a source of both wonder and incomprehension. So the, the main question for our research is what did these writings mean? then and now. And then we argue that the book, that Omar's writing were systematically ignored, distorted, and dismissed by defenders of racism, slavery, and white supremacy. And then in the last part of the book, we propose to restore the Islamic and West African meanings of Omar's text in a way that also illuminates contemporary American debates on racism and also consider Arabic as an American literary language. So that is basically what the book <clears throat> that we are hoping that it is under review now with UNC Press, hoping that we will be able to release it uh, next, sometimes next year. And in the book, <coughs> which I will not go into detail, but uh, Professor Ernst will talk more briefly, we have five chapters. And we address actually key issues that were raised in the earlier meeting of today with Jennifer and Did you want to project? Oh, no, 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 yeah. We, we talk in the first chapter, you don't want to miss it, it is a land lost. We try to argue what did Omar lose in West Africa mm -hmm. by looking at it historically, what was there from the 16th, 17th, 18th century, and look at probabilities that Omar based on what we know. He told us he spent 25 years studying, he went to Bundu, we know what Bundu, what was at Bundu at that time. He was from Futatoro, he mentioned his chefs, he gave us name of his village and so on. And so we look at all these things, you know, to, to, to just to add to, to some key elements. I know we, our friends talk more about Omar's village, but in our argument somewhere we said, maybe Omar didn't want to tell us about his village. Because he's the guy who 25 years, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he lists the names of the Owens family members in details. Mm -hmm. He talks about, you know, even the lawyer who came to pick him up from Fayetteville after running away. So why did he really care less, to, only in a, a half a paragraph talks about Africa, mm -hmm. but in details talk about America. So, and the first African-American poet, you know, uh, uh, Phyllis, uh, Wheatley. Huh? Wheatley. Yeah, Wheatley. Wheatley, was, Wheatley was kidnapped from Senegal when she was seven, but she remembers her family in Senegal and keep it there. But Omar was 37, so we can't, yeah. So we, we put it in that, that context of it, yeah. So in chapter two, a life, you know, unread, and we talk about what was missed in Omar's life in America. And chapter three will be just analyzing Omar's sermons, we call it sermons, unheard, how it was misread by the public. And chapter five is the betrayal of the experts. Mm -hmm. We talk really uh, about... You forgot <laughs> chapter four. Yeah, chapter four is the Muslim in church, yeah, yeah, Muslim in church, which is a really interesting read that Omar, you know, was a Muslim in church. So in a way that we should not you know, misunderstand and how Omar became, uh, if Omar conquered or not, but let us look at the evidence, that's why we call it Muslim in church. But chapter five is the betrayal of the, of the experts. We look at the role of American earlier scholarly associations in, as intermediary between Omar's work, Omar writes in Arabic, the Owens and the, the you know, Antwerp will read on Arabic, so you have the expert community translating. So we look at the role of this expert in Miss translating Omar's work. So this, this, this is the book, uh, Prof will talk more about it. Abdul Rahman was a man in a hurry. He was trying to sell his documents at these lectures in order to raise funds to, to procure this, the freedom of his children. 
only eight documents survive. There must have been far more, more produced, yeah. but people just tossed them away. Uh, so <clears throat> there's a reason for us to look at these other figures. Our primary interest has been in, <clears throat> in Omar Ibn Sayyid, but um, we want to put this into the context of other writers who were enslaved Muslims. And so uh, let's quickly summarize the project that Mbai and I have uh, recently completed. And by the way, the title of our book manuscript is I Cannot Write My Life, which is a quotation from the autobiography of Omar Ibn Sayyid, who realized that no one was able to read his life. And this is part of our conclusions. His 18 writings of Omar were all, first of all, written and addressed to white elite enslavers principally the members of the Owen family. They were unreadable. No one could understand them. But they were built as sermons, which were uh, sermons about the need to repent and to seek salvation from God. And they were accompanied by talismanic drawings of protection and safety. This is what scholars were trained to do in West Africa. They were trained to teach and to heal. And he was writing even though no one could understand it. He drew, draws heavily on the Quran, on Islamic theological texts, and Sufi writings. Our discoveries are that there are at least a half a dozen texts that he quotes that nobody had realized before. And the biggest misrepresentation or lie about him was the notion that he had converted to Christianity this was basically uh, a cover-up uh, that the missionary establishment used in order to try to raise funds for their own activities. They wanted to say that they had somebody who converted to Islam, from, from Islam to Christianity. The missionary activities in the Middle East were remarkably unsuccessful to convert Muslims. And many of the missionaries ended up going after the Eastern Christians who were not Christian enough for them, but uh, the actual success in converting Muslims was practically uh, hard, impossible to find. So, uh, just quickly, the 18 documents of Omar Ibn Sayyid, we have uh, gone through the manuscripts and we have done a critical edition for the first time. So, we have described the contents of each manuscript very exactly, and we've also provided the corrected modern standard version of this. So now we can tell you what's in the text and tell you exactly when the same thing is repeated. And this is the best way to gain control over the meaning of, of a work like this. Uh, this is going to be output as a critical edition in this form. We're using a software that is at the University of Maryland. So we are going to be presenting the, uh, these final versions that are almost ready for online publication. And this is our, uh, our book pu publication and uh, our, our conclusions. And as Vi pointed out, it was the racism and the missionary colonialism that was uh, uh, one of the main factors in preventing a, a real appreciation of his writing. And here are some of the characters who play a role in his uh, life. John Owen, the governor of North Carolina, also a student at the University of North Carolina in 1804. There's Omar in the center, and on the right is the evil Hodgson, as we call him, the uh, first Arabic scholar in the U.S. diplomatic service who married the richest woman in Georgia and took control over three immense plantations and over 600 enslaved people. And he was a scholar of Arabic. He, could, he corresponded with Omar Ibn Sayyid in Arabic. He tried to hire Omar as a research assistant for the... Uh, establishment of uh, study of the Fulani people in their language, Omar refused. You'll notice in the picture of Hodgson, there's a scroll hanging off of his desk. If anybody wants to ask a question later on about what's written on there in Arabic, we can tell you. Now, this is our next steps, which we are proposing. 
we're setting up a new website at the uh, UNC Library's digital repository on uh, writings of Muslims enslaved in the Americas, where we're going to have Arabic text, translation, uh, commentary, images, and links, and also translations of documents, texts which they quote which are, for instance, poems written by Abu Madian, the great uh, Arabic Sufi scholar of uh, North Africa, and others. So this is something which we are just getting started on, and uh, we welcome uh, participation of, of others in this project. Now let me introduce to you this very interesting character, which we'll tell you about very quickly here, Sheikh Sanasi. We don't know very much about him. It's basically three documents written by him in Arabic with some commentary in English on the margins. He's described as recaptured, which actually means, not what I put up here, that he, was, he had attempted to flee, but he was one of the people who was on a slave ship that was after the, the halt of the international slave trade. So the British would intercept these slave ships, and then they would take all the people to the one colony that they controlled in West Africa, which was Sierra Leone, and they would dump them there. And then they would probably sell them into indentured servitude, which was pretty similar to slavery except for the name. Hmm. And so some of them would uh, try to get out of that situation by uh, accepting a deal to go to the Caribbean. And that seems to have been what happened to him. And he is described in the notations to the letters as being a laborer on the Panama Canal Railroad. This was constructed between 1850 and 1855, and it must have been one of the worst jobs in the world. Because they were trying to drive a railway through dense jungles, five foot deep in water, snakes, poisonous insects, you name it. And so Sheikh Sanasi was probably a veteran of this. We have these documents because there was a self-funded missionary named John, sorry, Frederick Hicks, who was a graduate of Williams College. And in 1860, he went down to Central America and spent the next nine years setting up a Sunday school and trying to preach the Bible to, uh, especially to Africans who were there. He did so with notable failure. And uh, the documents that we have, he sent to Theodore Dwight of the American Ethnological Society, who was also active in collecting the works of Omar ibn Sayyid and other uh, African scholars. Uh, we have some very bad translations of these letters by two uh, missionary figures, Dr. William Thompson, who was born in Beirut, is, grew up as a missionary child. His father was one of the founders of American University, Beirut. And Reverend Isaac Bird, who was uh, another missionary and who worked on Omar's writings. There are three letters that survive. Four were sent to Theodore Dwight, but only three are there. These are in the Library of Congress collection. And this is a really remarkable uh, set, series of documents. I'll just show you very quickly the first one has the note received from Mr. Frederick Higgs. Letter number two has a few more details. A recaptured African, a laborer on the railroad, who was attending the Sunday school of, of Higgs. Now, I'm not sure why he was attracted to do this. Maybe there was some free food or something like that. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting documents written in a combination of red and black ink. He switches the color of the ink when he changes the subject. And here's the, the last one. It's, the date has been interpreted wrong by the Library of Congress cataloger. It can't be 1854 because Hicks did not get to Panama until 1860. And if you look at the, the way the letters are formed, I think you can agree with me, 1864. And this is especially for a buy. I wanted to show them the pictures I found of the uh, uh, missionary types, Theodore Dwight, uh, Thompson, yeah. and Isaac Byrd. And I call them here the baffled experts, because they did not have a good handle on this material. What is in these documents? Number one, we have the direct quotation of a text called the Litanies of the Weak. It's also known as the Litanies of Osama. 
It's a story of uh, Muhammad ibn Osama, who in uh, 10th century Persia was thrown into jail in Isfahan because he was suspected of being a Parmati heretic. While he was in prison, the Prophet Muhammad appeared to him and told him that if he recited the following prayers, one set of prayers for every day of the week, he would get out of jail free. Can you imagine the resonance of this kind of a practice for enslaved Muslims? It's, it's, it's pretty strong stuff. Uh, the second letter has a few autobiographical elements. He refers to having studied in Futa Jalon. It reads like Omar's work. He repeatedly greets with peace. He says, O Salimu, kol al muslimin wal muslimat. I send my greeting of peace to all the Muslim men and women. He's saying these to the greetings of the community. He then presents a series of eight selections from the Quran, each of which contains a variation on the word subhanAllah, glory be to God. These are clearly prayers which are designed to accomplish a certain function because they all contain this word glorification. Thompson refers to these as random verses. Number three, begins with blessings on the great Sufi saint of Baghdad, Abu Khadr al-Jilani, who is so important because the Qadri order is found in West Africa as well. And uh, it, it repeats the eight glorification verses, and then it gives you another text that he's quoting in literal length, which is a, an Arabic work called The Alchemy of Happiness, written by a Palestinian scholar named Yahya al-Ramli, who in the late 15th century traveled from Palestine to Egypt to study with the great jurist Sahawi. And this tells you about the efficacy and power of every chapter, every verse, every vowel, every punctuation mark in the Quran. So uh, there are problems with reading this text. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. He does something that's rather odd, where he kind of adds extra alephs by way of by way of decoration, perhaps. And so, to reconstruct it, you can see in the top line of the Arabic, I put the extra alephs in red. If we pull those out and make a couple of other changes, we have an interesting. Uh, this is our effort at, at interpretation. It was unintelligible to Dr. Thompson, according to a notation on the sheet at that, that point in the manuscript. But I read it as Sa'altuka uh, Musta Hiksuna, Master, our Master Hicks. Fi Balad Ismaho, and then there's a name we can't really figure out what it is. It's, he's referring to some country. When he writes the names of the places he visited, mm -hmm. we can barely make out Sierra Leone, but he puts in the vowel marks in places where they actually make sense. And he, he refers to Dominica which he calls Jumbanik. And so there are some problems with reading these things, it real challenges. But um, I just will, I'll conclude by saying, let's take a look at each of these authors and see how are they distinctive. Um, his letters are addressed to a community of Muslim men and women. The experts could not understand them. They have some formal gestures that are similar to Omar's writings, writing in the third person. I think that it's possible that to talk about this as the impact of slavery on a writer, but it's also possible to see this as an expression of Sufi ethical practice. It's very common in Eastern texts, which I've worked on, for people to avoid the use of the first person pronoun and verb. And they will refer to themselves as papir and, and say, he did this, he, he did that. And I think that this is an arguable uh, interpretation of that particular thing. Uh, the emphasis on teach, telling about yourself in terms of the teachers and where you study is obviously fundamental to the identity of these figures. And um, finally, this is extremely conservative in terms of preserving practices and texts which go back a long ways, and which also demonstrate a network of exchange 
that is far more extensive than people realize. I mean, these texts from Palestine and Persia are circulating in West Africa. And I can tell you that we, I've checked on some other examples, like the poem of Abu Madian that's quoted by Omar ibn Sayyid. If you look on the website of the Hill Manuscript Library, in the one that's run by monks in Minnesota, if you don't know about this, check it out. Hill Manuscript and Museum and something like that. Hill. It's very easy to find. There are 150 manuscript copies of the, that poem by Abu Madian in there that they have cataloged in Mali alone. Huh. This is stuff that people were reading and memorizing. Because all of these writers are writing these down from memory. They don't have access right. to a library. Mm -hmm. So uh, each of these slaves is distinctive in their, their use of writing. But the importance of writing cannot be denied. So we propose this as a project to recover this uh, important cultural, religious, literary phenomenon as part of our history that has been forgotten and ignored.